Donkey Kong. Everyone knows Donkey Kong. One of Nintendo's first characters, an arcade giant on release who continues to regularly appear all over their games. But while Nintendo made Donkey Kong initially, I think Rare are the ones who deserve the credit for making Donkey Kong who he is today and for fleshing out the characters and setting of the franchise well beyond anything Nintendo had done with the series before. Welcome to Rare Retrospective, a series where I explore the catalog of classics and flops released by Rare throughout their 40 year history. Today we're going to be talking about Donkey Kong Country, one of their most famous releases which is still beloved to this day. And if you're interested in seeing where else the series takes us, make sure you subscribe to the channel. In the last episode, we talked about Rare's time on the NES, during which they released over 40 games between the years 1987 and 1992. As I discussed in that video, Rare was fairly slow at moving on from the NES to 16-bit consoles and decided to invest in expensive silicon graphics workstations for creating 3D models, a move which put Rare technologically ahead of most other game developers at the time. With their new workstations, Rare was working on a tech demo for a 3D boxing game that never saw the light of day. While Nintendo staff was on a visit to Rare HQ, they were shown the boxing demo and Nintendo was so impressed that they tasked Rare with creating a game for the SNES that used their SGI graphics using a pre-existing Nintendo IP. Rare asked for Donkey Kong and Nintendo obliged, leading to the 1994 release of Donkey Kong Country. But before we can talk about Donkey Kong Country, we need to talk about Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong was the very first game conceived by industry legend Shigeru Miyamoto. A 1981 arcade release starring a brave carpenter who climbs a tower of girders to rescue an at the time unnamed woman who was kidnapped by the titular Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong is also the first game to feature Nintendo's mascot, Mario. Though he was only actually referred to as Mario in a single English promotional flyer for the game, which for some reason exclusively refers to him as Little Mario, which is so condescending. I don't think Donkey Kong actually needs a formal introduction though. It's one of the most famous video games of all time. He throws barrels and Mario jumps over them. We all know this. Slightly less famous, but still pretty famous, are the sequels to Donkey Kong that Nintendo put out. The second game in the series was Donkey Kong Jr., reversing the roles of the first game with Mario now playing the villain, keeping poor Donkey Kong locked in a cage he barely fits in. The player must guide Junior up and across hanging ropes to rescue his father from the cruel and sinister Mario. These two arcade releases were referenced extensively by the Donkey Kong Country games, not only in terms of characters and such, but a lot of gameplay concepts are revisited and refined as well, as we'll soon see. There's also Donkey Kong 3, where DK is, for some reason, just hanging out in this random guy's greenhouse punching beehives. Donkey Kong 3 isn't really as relevant to Donkey Kong Country as the first two games are, but I wanted to bring it up for posterity and because I think it's really funny how much of an ass Donkey Kong is in these old arcade games. Like, can you imagine being Stanley in this situation? You go to check on your garden and there's a goddamn gorilla jumping around causing all sorts of havoc. You have no idea how he got in or why he's here. What an absolute nightmare. Maybe Mario was right to lock him up, honestly. Unfortunately, Donkey Kong 3 came out in 1983, which was a really bad year to be a video game, because the entire industry crashed into a huge recession in the United States where a very large portion of the market was located. Because of this circumstance, Donkey Kong 3 was a commercial disappointment and the Donkey Kong franchise went into dormancy until 1994, which saw the release of two Donkey Kong games, Nintendo's Donkey Kong for the Game Boy and Rare's Donkey Kong Country for the SNES. With Donkey Kong Country, Rare elevated the series to new places it had never been before. Donkey Kong Country was the first time Donkey Kong himself was a playable character in one of his games, and only the second time he wasn't the antagonist. It creates an entire supporting cast of both heroes and enemies, introduced a world for them to live in, and expanded elements from the arcade games into something entirely new. Through the Donkey Kong Country trilogy, Rare fleshed out the Donkey Kong franchise to levels Nintendo themselves had never attempted before, and by the end of their time working with Nintendo, it was seen just as much Rare's IP as it was Nintendo's by the public at large. But that's enough preamble. It's time to talk about Donkey Kong Country. Donkey Kong Country had an 18-month development period, which was actually somewhat long for the time, even though it's short relative to modern games. Early on in development, Rare went through a few story concepts that ended up scrapped for one reason or another, which Rare's creative director Greg Mails has shared via Twitter in the past. 
Rare's first pitch to Nintendo was a game called Donkey Kong vs. Super Wario. The story opens with Wario finishing work on his time machine, immediately before being attacked and turned to stone by Wario, with Donkey Kong being tasked with his rescue. This pitch was rejected because Nintendo wanted the game to feature an original villain rather than a pre-existing Nintendo character. So Rare scrapped Donkey Kong vs. Super Wario and came up with a new pitch, repurposing the villains they had designed for a cancelled PC and Mac adventure game titled Johnny Blastoff and the Kremlin Armada. Donkey Kong and the Golden Bananas was their new pitch, and it has a lot more similarities to the final product than Donkey Kong vs. Super Wario did. In this story, Donkey Kong is tasked with guarding Grandpa Kong's Golden Banana, but while he's not paying attention, Corporal Krizzle from the Kremlings bops him on the head and steals it. This somehow puts the entire island in danger, so DK calls upon Donkey Kong Jr. to help him get it back. You might notice this design of Jr. looks an awful lot like Diddy Kong. You see, when Rare showed Donkey Kong and the Golden Bananas to Nintendo, they actually took issue with Junior's design and requested that they either make him look more like he did originally or make him a new character entirely. Rare thought their design looked better in the setting they were making, so they renamed him to Diddy Kong. Grandpa Kong is also a clear early iteration of what would become Cranky Kong. Speaking of Cranky Kong, I need to come clean. I've lied to you. Donkey Kong Country is not actually the first game in which the original Donkey Kong is a playable character. That's actually Donkey Kong Barrel Blast, released in 2007 for the Wii. Don't worry, I can explain. Sometime around when they replaced Junior with Donkey Kong, Rare also changed up the chronology of their game. Rather than starring the original Donkey Kong who kidnapped Pauline in 1981, it actually stars Donkey Kong III, son of Donkey Kong Jr. The OG Donkey Kong is actually Cranky Kong, whose first playable appearance was Donkey Kong Barrel Blast on the Nintendo Wii. Hey, sorry to interrupt the video. I'm here in editing, and it turns out that none of this Barrel Blast stuff is true, actually. I just found out about the Game & Watch title Donkey Kong Circus from 1984, which is the true first playable appearance of Donkey Kong. Sorry, that's my mistake. Okay, let's get back to the video now. No other early pitches of Donkey Kong Country have been shared, so it's reasonable to imagine the game's premise started to take its final shape around this time. In the actual game, King K. Roll and his army of Kremlings have stolen Donkey Kong's banana horde, and your objective is to traverse DK Island in pursuit to get the stolen bananas back. We actually have a storyboard for an opening cutscene that shows two Kremlings knocking Diddy out and stealing the bananas, but this never ended up in the game itself. As a side note, it's canon that K. Rool doesn't actually like bananas at all, so his sole motivation must be for Donkey Kong to starve to death. I don't know what his problem is, I don't think they've even met before this. Moving on into the game itself, Donkey Kong Country is a fairly standard 2D platformer. DK can jump on or roll through enemies, he can slap the ground like in Smash Bros, and of course, he can pick up and throw barrels. Donkey Kong is defeated in one hit, but luckily he's joined by his buddy Diddy Kong. By finding a DK barrel in a stage, you can bust it open and rescue the Kong trapped inside, giving you a second hit before you lose a life and the ability to freely swap characters. Before I start going into more detail about how the game plays though, I want to talk about how it looks. The visuals are literally the reason the game came into existence, so it seems fair to give them first billing. At the time of its release, Donkey Kong Country was an amazing game, doing things nobody thought the SNES was capable of. The environments are highly detailed, and the game goes to great effort to create a powerful feeling of atmosphere with lighting and weather changes from stage to stage working hand in hand with the calm, ambient soundtrack. And it works really well. No other game I've played on the SNES has an atmosphere like Donkey Kong Country does, and that includes its sequels too. But before anything else, we need to address the elephant in the room. This game looks kinda rough on modern displays. Its visuals have been completely left behind as technology has advanced and we stopped playing games on blurry CRTs. DKC looked truly incredible on the screens of the time, and it honestly looked like it was genuinely being rendered in 3D by the SNES. If there's any game you can use to make an argument in favor of CRT post-processing filters, it's Donkey Kong Country. The footage on screen now was recorded using the Nintendo Switch Online app's built-in CRT filter, and I think the difference is stark. I don't even particularly like the filter this app uses, these games just were not meant for the crispness of modern displays. But I know post-processing filters are controversial, and for good reason with how terrible so many of them look, so I'll have it disabled for the rest of the video. 
Just know that these games weren't designed to be seen at this level of immaculate detail, and the illusion of them actually being 3D was much more effective in the 90s. The process through which Rare achieved Donkey Kong Country's look was known as Advanced Computer Modeling, or ACM. Their silicon graphics workstations allowed them to create highly detailed 3D models, but the SNES can't actually render these models natively. ACM was a process through which the models were created, rigged, and animated on SGI workstations, and then each individual frame of animation was separately rendered out and converted into a lower quality 2D sprite that the SNES could display without difficulty. This process was used for a number of SNES and even N64 games, and is notably different from how Super FX games like Star Fox made use of 3D. With ACM, all the complex rendering work is done in advance on separate hardware, allowing for pseudo 3D visuals with no performance hit. Star Fox and a handful of other games rendered 3D elements in real time, requiring most of the SNES's own processing power in addition to an extra CPU chip in the game cartridge itself. But who cares about graphics? Have I mentioned this game's soundtrack? Donkey Kong Country's soundtrack is immaculate. It was composed primarily by Evelyn Fisher and David Wise, plus one track by Robin Beanland. The DKC OST is full of iconic tracks with memorable and catchy melodies, but it also has a sort of somber ambience to it. The music complements the visuals incredibly well and creates a fantastic atmosphere in most of the game's levels. Not a lot of games were trying things like this with their soundtracks at the time, especially not platformers and other action games. Can you imagine this moody, subdued track playing in Super Mario World? The music of Donkey Kong Country really stood out among its peers and stuck in the memories of every kid who played these games. I love this soundtrack so much. I think it's well past time we talk about how the game actually plays, though. Like I said before, Donkey Kong Country is a fairly standard 2D platformer in terms of gameplay. Boiled down to the absolute basics, it's a game where you travel from the left end of a stage to the right while jumping over hazards and collecting items along the way. DKC does do its best to pull from and adapt elements from the arcade games. There are barrels all over the place you can pick up and toss at enemies, and in the latter half of the game there are even orangutan enemies who will toss barrels for you to jump over just like DK did in the original arcade game, sort of replicating that classic Donkey Kong gameplay for a bit. The rope climbing of Donkey Kong Jr. also makes an appearance as a core game mechanic, with many of the game's levels featuring hanging ropes you can climb up and down or swing from. These aren't as ubiquitous as the barrels are, but you see them more than most other level elements. I mentioned before that finding and busting open a DK barrel will rescue the Kong inside and give you an extra hit. When you take damage, the Kong you're controlling panics and takes off, swapping your control to the other. You can also manually swap at any time with the A button. Diddy moves faster and jumps higher than Donkey Kong, but Donkey can easily defeat enemies like Clump and Crusha, who Diddy just bounces off of. The two of them also carry barrels differently, which does affect gameplay. Donkey carries them over his head and throws them farther, but Diddy holds them in front of him, allowing them to be used like a shield. Between levels, you're placed on a world map screen, which mostly serves as a level select. You can go back to any level you've already completed whenever you please, though travel between major areas is somewhat restricted. Aside from levels, while navigating the world map you can also find various allies of Donkey Kongs. The first one you can find around the map is Cranky Kong, the original Donkey Kong I spoke about earlier. Cranky Kong gives you tips on levels in the world you find him in, but only after you listen to an extended rant about how much better games were back in the day. As a retro gaming YouTube channel, I find myself agreeing with Cranky Kong maybe a bit too much sometimes. One of DK's most valuable allies is Candy Kong, Donkey Kong's girlfriend who saves your game progress. She has the honor of being one of only two Kongs who have never been playable in any video game ever. Candy Kong has one save point in every world, and you can save as much as you want without restrictions, with the caveat that you have to actually reach her booth before you can save. Once you've moved on from one world to the next, you can't easily backtrack, so the beginning of each world is always a bit of a gauntlet until you find Candy. Or you could find DK's last ally, Funky Kong. Everyone loves Funky Kong. He's the life of the party! This is his first appearance in the series, and he runs an airport. At Funky's flights, you can instantly travel to any space on the world map you've been before. Aside from moving forward after defeating a boss, Funky Kong is the only way you can travel between worlds. This means if you find him before you find Candy, you can travel back to a previous area to save your game, and then come back. Also, the song that plays here is the one I mentioned before that Robin Beanland composed, if you were wondering about that.
Those three are the only friends you'll find around the world map, but within the levels themselves you can find some of DK's animal friends. These friends include Rambi the Rhino, who charges through stages at high speeds and barrels through enemies with no trouble, and Guard the Swordfish, who improves your mobility underwater and provides the only means to attack underwater foes, Expresso the Ostrich, who runs very fast, glides, and has cool sneaks, Squawks the Parrot, who appears in one single stage and just carries a lamp for you, and Winky the Frog, who can jump extra high and is kinda hard to control and honestly is a little bit of a liability a lot of the time. The Animal Buddies all appear in specific places and generally make the levels they're in much easier. They also give you an extra hit as you'll just be knocked off of them like Yoshi in Super Mario World, rather than losing one of your Kongs. If they don't run away out of bounds, you can even get back on them. The Animal Buddies are not only useful for clearing the stages, but they're often required to access secrets. There are even animal bonus stages accessed by collecting three golden tokens of a specific animal. These stages put you in control of an animal buddy and give you a minute and a half to collect as many tokens as you can, with every 100 providing an extra life. If you know what you're doing, you can rack up lives very quickly with these. The levels in DKC are absolutely crammed full of content, with all sorts of hidden collectibles, bonus rooms, secret power-ups, and warps to find. Bananas serve as the Donkey Kong equivalent to Mario's coins, with a hundred of them granting a 1-up. You can find both individual bananas and bunches that are worth 10 apiece. Every stage also features the letters K, O, N, and G, and if you manage to spell the whole word, you get a free 1-up. Aside from these primary collectibles, there are patches of ground you can bust open to pull out useful items like indestructible steel kegs or walls you can bust through for a bonus room. And the game encourages you to seek these out by tracking your completion percentage on the file select screen, going all the way up to 101% if you find absolutely everything there is to find in the game. The levels also mix things up frequently with different hazards and gimmicks. This combined with the different gameplay styles of the Animal Buddies and all the secrets to hunt for help keep the game from ever feeling stale. Even just the fact that Donkey and Diddy have slightly different capabilities keeps you on your toes and changes how you have to approach different obstacles when you're missing one of them. Stages also frequently feature recurring gimmicks like the famous minecart stages that have since become a staple of the Donkey Kong series. The minecart stages move you automatically along rails at high speed, throwing obstacles like pits and down carts at you the entire time. These stages are really fun, but they can get really mean and pretty much require a lot of practice and memorization. Another series staple that started here are the Barrel Blast levels. Throughout the game, you can find barrel cannons that launch you around, and some stages are built entirely around intricate barrel blast courses that test the limits of your sense of timing. There are also level gimmicks that are used only once in the entire game, like Stop and Go Station, a terrifying stage where you have to play red light green light with invincible rock croc enemies that sprint back and forth whenever the light is green. This stage is pretty early on, so it's not too difficult, but look at how scary it is! The bonus rooms you find are pretty varied as well. Sometimes they just give you a ton of bananas, some of them have barrel blast courses in them, and there are shell games and slots and other little mini games too. There's even a bonus stage hidden inside a DIFFERENT bonus stage, which was absolutely put here to sell strategy guides. While that specific bonus room is definitely the hardest to find, the bonuses in general are pretty sneaky, often requiring you to spot the very edge of a barrel cannon at the bottom of a pit, which might not have even been visible depending on the overscan of your CRT, or they'll require you to carry a barrel over enemies to rub it against a nondescript wall in order to open a door. Donkey Kong Country is in general a pretty hard game, but I think it's mostly fair about it, aside from some very mean traps in some of the later levels. The biggest exacerbating factor to the game's difficulty is just the fact that you have to play most of a world before unlocking the save point, but if you're diligent about looking for bonus rooms, the game showers you with extra lives, and you can always use Funky's Flights to go back to earlier stages to farm lives there if you really find yourself in need of them. In addition to all of this, Donkey Kong Country boasts two separate multiplayer modes. There's a competitive mode where the players have separate progress and take turns to race each other through the game, and a cooperative mode where one player controls Donkey Kong and player two controls Diddy Kong, swapping control whenever the Kongs would swap in a single player game or upon death. I never really played much of the competitive mode, but the co-op holds a very special place in my heart. When I was a kid, I played this game all the time in co-op with my family, and as an adult I've had tons of fun playing it with friends through the Switch's online features. It may feel a bit basic to go back to without any form of simultaneous play, but the Switch on Hit style of multiplayer works really well in this game. 
When you get hit, everything pauses until the new player presses a button, so they don't have to be ready to pick up the game at a moment's notice, and it's pretty chill to just sit back and watch your buddy play for a bit after you died in a really boneheaded way. The two Kongs playing differently from each other also adds an interesting element to the co-op gameplay. In a single-player playthrough, you'll be swapping Kongs frequently as you encounter obstacles one handles better than the other. In co-op, this is still the case, but with the extra wrinkle that the individual player's talents can also be taken into account. If one of you is better at the bonus games than the other, you can swap out before starting them, or if you're not confident in your ability to finish a tricky platforming section, you can make your friend do it instead. There's also just something special about the shared adversity of trying to push through some of the more brutally difficult levels together, cheering each other on, and hoping that they manage to clear it so you can both move on. Like going to war, once you've played through all of Donkey Kong Country with someone, your friendship will have deepened immeasurably, and your bond will never be severed. And of course, what action game would be complete without boss fights? Every world of Donkey Kong Country ends in a boss fight. But honestly, as much as I adore this game, the bosses are kind of a weak link for me. For the most part, they're all very simple affairs and aren't anywhere near as difficult as the rest of the game, either. For most of them, you just need to avoid their attacks and then either jump on their head or throw a barrel at them. Two of the game's seven bosses are recolors as well, so there are really only five unique boss fights. There is this weird oil drum boss, though, that just bounces up and down on the screen and then drops enemies on you that you need to kill. It's also not very difficult, but it's unique and a lot more interesting than jumping on a beaver that's just walking back and forth aimlessly. And then there's the final boss, King K. Rule himself. As down as I am on the other bosses in this game, I love the K. Rule fight. It's a lot longer and more involved than the other boss fights in the game, with K. Rule mixing up his attacks and movement patterns every few hits. His theme music, Gangplank Galleon, is also an incredible track. It might be my favorite in the game, and it's playing right now. Once you've bopped him on the head a few times, the game is over and credits roll. And they're pretty unusual credits, honestly. I don't even see Greg Mails in here at all. He must be using a pseudonym or something- OH SHIT! The devious and dastardly King K. Rule has fooled us with a most clever trick! Fake credits! He gets right back up and keeps attacking, and if you're a little kid who just beat this super hard game, you're celebrating and not reading the very obviously fake credits, and then he stands up and he kills you before you can react. It's great. The guys who made this game are so mean, and I love them for it. He only takes three more hits to go down at this point, for real this time. For as much of a letdown the other boss fights are, with pretty much all of them just being sized up regular enemies with very basic attack patterns, the fight with K. Roll is a fantastic capstone to a fantastic game. I also just love K. Roll as a villain, though a lot of that is because of how much his personality is fleshed out in later games. But I do love that when he throws his crown, he makes direct eye contact with you, the player, like, Hey, did you see that? Pretty cool, huh? Once K. Roll goes down for real, you get an actual ending, real credits, and a nice little cast roll that names all the enemies. And if you found everything, you win the greatest prize of all, your grandfather's love. He could have done it in one life, though. And in less than an hour, too. There's still so much more left to say about Donkey Kong Country. The game was a breakout success and left a huge legacy, changing the franchise as a whole forever. Even after Nintendo sold their shares in Rare to Microsoft, rather than changing things up entirely, they instead had their own developer, Retro Studios, make a new Donkey Kong Country based on the Rare classics. Speaking of Nintendo's shares in Rare, the incredible success of Donkey Kong Country was the final thing that led to Nintendo buying those in the first place. A few months after the release of DKC, after it had already sold several million units, Nintendo bought a 25% stake in Rare, which over time was increased all the way up to 49%, making Rare an official second-party developer for Nintendo and further deepening their already close partnership. DKC has also been ported to various other platforms over time, including a surprisingly faithful Game Boy Color adaptation. There's some concessions made due to hardware limitations, but if you're on a long car ride with your parents and all you've got is your Game Boy Color, it more than suffices as a substitute for the SNES game. The Game Boy release Donkey Kong Land is also heavily based on Donkey Kong Country, but it features its own original level design and is less of a port and more of a different take on the same game. 
There is also a GBA port that blows out the color so you can see it on a tiny dark screen, crunches up the music, and adds weird voice samples because Nintendo insisted on doing that for all of their GBA ports. If you can get past those aesthetic changes though, it's a pretty good version of the game that offers some nice quality of life improvements like the option to save whenever you want instead of needing to reach Candy's save point. Instead of saving your game, Candy lets you play one of the funniest minigames I have ever seen in my life. The GBA port also implements that scrapped opening cutscene I mentioned before, which is kinda crazy. The dialogue in the intro is really bizarre, too. This port's just very funny to me in general. I think in most respects, Donkey Kong Country holds up phenomenally well. The graphics look a bit muddy on an HD TV, and there are some questionable design choices like the highly restrictive save system or Diddy Kong just being way better than Donkey Kong. But the level design holds up, and the game is still really fun to play through today, whether you're alone or with a friend. And of course, the soundtrack is one of the best on the console. And after Donkey Kong Country was such an incredible success, they would be fools not to make a sequel or two. In the years following its release, Rare refined and built upon the gameplay to make two SNES sequels, which improve upon a lot of the first game's flaws while also doubling down on others. All three entries in the series are fantastic games though, and you know I can't wait to tell you about them, so make sure you don't miss the next episode, which is all about Donkey Kong Country 2. For now though, I think I've rambied on about Donkey Kong Country for long enough. As you can probably tell, I absolutely love this game. I played it all the time when I was a kid, either alone or in two-player mode with my parents and siblings. I have an absolutely incredible amount of nostalgia for this series and for the first entry in particular, and I would love to read about your own experiences with the game in the comments. And if you haven't played Donkey Kong Country before, you're doing yourself a disservice. It's on the Nintendo Switch Online SNES app, so what are you waiting for? Go play it! The video's over, go on! DK's gonna starve without his bananas! Get out of here!